to our esteemed guests, dignitaries, teachers, researchers, students, and all other delegates present here. It's our privilege to host a program of this magnitude. Department of History is proudly organizing interaction with eminent scholar on behalf of the Internal Quality Assurance Center, scheduled for two days consecutively today and tomorrow. The University of Kerala has proud research and academic culture pertaining to the discovery, development, and communication and the application of knowledge in the wider arena. As a part of this, we are extremely happy in collaborating with IQAC for such innovations. Dear all, we are commencing the opening sessions of the two-day program right now. Before starting the session, we have a humble request. Kindly switch off your mobile phone or put it in silent mode. A day without prayer is a day without blessing. And a life without prayer is a life without power. We begin the program with a prayer. I call upon the Shilpa for the prayer song. ever-changing world, global awareness and interconnectedness through internationalization of education has a significant role to play in shaping the next generations of learners. Several universities have special programs that provide outstanding graduates and young researchers with opportunities to interact with dignified scholars who pioneer for the frontiers of knowledge. And our aim is to teach students to obtain knowledge by themselves and to work in ways that enable them to come up with new ideas. Generating new ideas is a key tenet to modern society. We need professionals who are culturally competent, talented, innovative and creative problem solvers, skilled and critical thinkers. Now, the University of Kerala is dedicated to discovery generation, development and communication and application of knowledge in a wide range of academic and professional fields with a view to expose students, teachers and researchers of the university to the learning and research environment prevailing in the institutions of repute, both Indian and global. And in this respect, we must appreciate the initiative of Indian and Quality Assurance Cell of our university that facilitated the programs like the one we are organizing here today and tomorrow. Dear participants, it is my privilege to have been asked to welcome our most respected invitees and other participants in the name of the Fraternity of the Discipline of History and other Social Sciences University of Kerala. Today, we have with us to chair the inaugural function of this academic event, Professor Dr. Simon Tadil, Director, IQAC University of Kerala. As we all know, 
He has been instrumental in elevating the status of our university into several heights for the last few years by effectively preparing the university in the accreditation and ranking. Sir, on behalf of the Fraternity of the School of Social Science and Department of History, University of Kerala, I am delighted to offer the most hospitable welcome filled with the desires, hopes and dreams all of us share. Welcome you, sir. We are fortunate in getting the most deserving person to inaugurate the meeting. That is none other than Professor Dr. Mohan Kundumel, Honorable Vice Chancellor, University of Kerala. The whole academic community of this university is obliged to him for his effective direction, planning and implementation of the developmental experiences that, uh, and other interventions. He is gifted with a very pleasing style, moderate approach and a positive thinking and is always ready to encourage our curricular and extracurricular activities. Sir, we are so much obliged to you for your magnanimity in accepting our invitation and reach here on time. Dear participants, please join me in giving our Honorable Vice Chancellor of University of Kerala the best cordial welcome. Welcome you, sir. <laughs> we are lucky to get an erudite scholar, Professor Anne Gerritsen, from world famous University of Warwick, United Kingdom. As, as her profile shows, her scholarship in the field of social science is profound indeed. I was very often wonderstruck by seeing her interventions in several universities. My words may not be capable of communicating our sense of gratitude to you, madam, but thanking you is the least word that I can say to show our appreciation for your magnanimity in visiting this institution and enlightening us. Thank you, Professor Anne Gerritsen. Look at you. Today we are fortunate in getting Dr. Burton Cletus, faculty member, Center for Historical Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. I am published to him for introducing Professor Anne Gerritsen to me, and he is very supporting in all our academic initiatives. Respected sir, we are so much obliged to you for coming over here with us to give a special address today, and on behalf of all the participants, it's my pleasure to extend a cheerful welcome to you, sir. Welcome. Looking alone, I can see many familiar faces, peers, past and present, colleagues, well-wishers, student community, and I am extremely thankful to all of you for coming over here on behalf of the Department of History. I welcome you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your welcome words. Proceeding to the session, Professor Dr. Sanyam Tatil, Director, RQMC, University of Kerala, Kharyotan, has graciously agreed to deliver the presidential address. So, we welcome you, sir, for the same. Good morning, one and all. The distinguished Honorable Vice Chancellor of our University, Professor Mohan Kunumil, uh, Professor Anne Gerritsen from the University of um, Warwick, and Professor Dr. Cletus from Jawaharlal Nehru University, uh, Professor Shaji from our own history department, faculty members of the different uh, social science department and from history, scholars, students, uh, Professor Ajay Kumar, Professor G. M. Nair, and ladies and gentlemen. In fact, uh, I am here basically representing IQAC, the internal quality assurance cell of our university, where we were discussing with the uh, visiting a distinguished scholar in the morning on what actually gives us your accreditation and ranking. What are the criteria and what are the parameters on which we actually uh, have improved. Now this is one of the schemes which we have in terms of improvising our ranking and accreditation status. And this flagship program is called Interaction with Eminent Scholars and we have one such eminent scholar along with Dr. Cletus, who is on campus today. The objective is to learn from best practices, to learn from the rich experience which these people have with them. And when they share it with us, we learn from them and we try to put that into practice and we try to see some of these good principles get, what do you call, mixed up and becomes part of the blended learning that we have here. So on that count, we are hosting a number of important dignitaries, 
across the country and even outside to interact with us. We have had Nobel laureates also speaking to uh, our scholars. And uh, that has, in a way, I won't say it has dramatically or very drastically created a change, but it has brought some change in the thinking uh, that we have in terms of our discipline. Because the last time we had somebody interacting from USA who was trying to look at the campus, and he gave us a very strong learning on why do we have such watertight departments acting as separate departments? Why don't the management people interact with commerce and law and economics? And what is the integration that takes place between the different departments in social science and so on? So on that level, he was talking about how perhaps we can have something like learning on happiness, learning on integration, learning on multidisciplinarity and so on and so forth. So I think a lot of those things will come up today when we are learning from the eminent scholar who is there with us. The topic is basically history and I'm not a man, I'm neither a historian nor a person from this particular faculty. But I know that uh, history in fact talks about what happened in the past, what happened in terms of war, what happens in terms of creating empires and dynasty and what happens in terms of material wealth. And much of it is something which uh, fascinates others in terms of new learning. And recently I was looking at one of the works in history where they were talking about the history of wars and how that actually has impacted social thinking. So it is on this count that even history turns out to be relevant in learning from all that has happened in the past and drawing lessons for the future. So, all kinds of learning, whether it is in history or in science, is, is, it, it is actually trying to simplify life, make life more meaningful, learn from the good things which have happened in the past, try to see how those are influencing in the future. So, on that count, with the little history that I know, I believe that there would be some crucial inputs which you are going to actually receive from the eminent speakers today. So I thank the distinguished uh, guests who have come down on accepting our invitation. I welcome them on behalf of University of Kerala and I also I thank our Honorable Vice Chancellor for sparing time for this flagship program of IQAC uh, with the History Department for sharing his thoughts and being present for inaugurating this workshop. I wish all of you the very best in your pursuits for knowledge and in your pursuits to learn history the way it is to be and to see that you contribute to the history of this university. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. We are moving on to the inauguration. President of today's wonderful function, Professor Simon Thattil, the invited guest who has come away from all the way from London, Professor Anne Jevickson, and the special address is given by Dr. Anne Thattil Cletus, the head of the department. Professor Shaji Aniruddin, eminent teachers, scholars, and my dear students. I am extremely happy and proud to be here in a 
wonderful function organized by the IQHP and history department. Sharing knowledge is the fundamental duty of any university. In fact, any university has to create knowledge and disseminate knowledge. And that is what we are doing right now. The speeches today will definitely be creating a lot of knowledge and the hall is full and it gets to the mind of each and every participant. And as Simon Tuckle has rightly said, he is not a historian and I am also not a historian. I am a medical doctor, to be specific, a radiologist. But do I use history? Yes. I also use history in a different context. When a person with disease, whom I call a patient, who comes to me, the first thing I ask him is the history. It's the history of present illness. This is the point. History of present illness. I will not stop there. And then I will ask the past history. Whatever he remembers about his health, everything I ask, I will not stop there. Then I will ask his family history. Then also I will not stop. Then I will ask his travel history. So the entire history possible of that individual is known to me. And if somebody is a good doctor, he would have reached the diagnosis without touching the patient. And this is what we do. And then, only then we touch the patient. But there is a problem. The history given by him is not accurate then your diagnosis goes wrong. But we have tricks by which we can elicit the accurate, correct history. And when you make it at large, this is what is happening to the history, this is what is happening to the health of the nations also. If you write a wrong history, then you think that the country was sick the country was diseased. But then, there are people who write wrong histories and write histories. And also, when you take a past history of a patient, they will tell that they had tuberculosis. And we know that tuberculosis would have created a lot of problem in, in him. And similarly, you take the history of a nation, then the country will say that we were under colonial rules. It is like tuberculosis. So this is what we suffered. And that colonialism must have created damage to our health. But then a person with tuberculosis will not die. He will survive if everything is done right. And that everything right is being done in our country. That's why we are progressing. If you just take just one or two data, at the time of independence, an average Indian will die at an age of 32. So just imagine how many of you will survive if today is 1947. But then today, an average Indian will live up to 70 years. And if that average Indian is a female from Kerala, will survive 73 years. So that is the way we have survived the colonies. This, that is the way we have survived the tuberculosis, the colonialism, uh, and the history is, I don't know, many people say that it is his story. It is never her story. And now, of course, when people like Madam are having, it is becoming her story also. It is not simply his story. And who writes the history? It's always the winner. The winner always writes the history. Just imagine the fate of Second World War or First World War is different. You will be learning another history. And therefore, the history which India is having may not be accurate. The history of real India may come because India is winning. India is succeeding. Indians are living up to 72 years. And therefore, the correct history will come, it has to come, and it's your duty who are living right now in the winning India to write the right history of India 
because that is the future. And as a doctor, I believe this will happen. And with these few words, I declare this wonderful conference, this session inaugurated. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your valuable words. We are happy with the presence of the learned academician, Dr. Bergen Cletus. Special address will be delivered by Dr. Bergen Cletus, faculty member, Center for Historical Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. He teaches modern Indian history at Center for Historical Studies, JNU, New Delhi. He was a postdoctoral fellow at the French Institute at Pondicherry and taught at Calcutta University. He so, is a recipient of Rockefeller Foundation Research Grant and has lectured at various universities. His area of expertise is history of medicine and science. We welcome you, sir, for the same. Extremely sorry, I have another program at the Senate Hall where we are inaugurating a lab for our students and faculty. So I'm going. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Honorable Dr. Shaji, Professor and Head of the Department University, Department of History, University of Kerala, uh, Professor Simon Patel, Director of IPAC, University of Kerala, Honorable Vice Chancellor who just inaugurated this uh, uh, this meeting, Professor Mohan and um, dear friends, teachers, it's a great privilege to be here when Professor Anne Gerritsen is speaking. And I would firstly thank Professor Shadi for extending the invitation to Professor Gerritsen for this eminent scholar program. Uh, I think uh, this is a very, very wonderful choice to, you know, to, to invite Professor Gerritsen because given the kind, I think you might have seen her CV, the kind of work Professor Gerritsen has done all through these years, the kind of scholarship, the kind of eminence, uh, this is absolutely a wonderful and the right choice. You might, the, the Honorable Vice Chancellor was speaking about what history is and we have brought out a new book recently two months back. The title of the book is Histories of Health and Materiality in the Indian Ocean World medicine, material culture and trade, 1600 to 2000. So that's the book. So, so history is not just about political history, it's not just about the wars, it's not just about the victories of people, it's something beyond. It's about travel, it's about trade, it's about materialities, it's about medicine, it's about emotions. It's a whole range of things that one could actually think about. And Kerala in particular, at the coast, it had historical links with, with the West, with the East, with Europe, with the Roman. There was uh, extensive trade in spices. It had trade with China. So, how are we connected? What makes Kerala, Kerala in that sense? Is it the geographical boundaries of a nation that connects us? Yes, of course, there is a political connection, political relationship. It's a political map that makes us Indians. But if you look at hist historically, it is the Indian Ocean world that linked Kerala. It was a connection with the Middle East, it was a connection with ancient Rome, and so on. I do not want to speak more, because you are all eagerly waiting to listen to Dr. Geritsen. She is a sinologist, she has worked extensively on China, on Chinese medicine, and a variety of other issues, including art and so on and so forth. So once again, I thank Dr. Shaji and the entire faculty of the Department of History for inviting Professor Gerritsen and, and inviting me to this event. And I stop here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anne Gerritsen is currently Professor, Department of History, University of Warwick, United Kingdom. She also functions as Chair of Asian Art, Labour Institute for Area Studies, 
and later in the University Center for Arts and Society, Leiden University. She has also been associated with various academic and research responsibilities, like Professor Kikaman Chair in Asia Europe Intellectual Exchange, with special attention to material culture art and human dynamics, University of Leiden, Federal Netherlands Institute for Advanced Studies in the Humanities and Social Sciences. Short-term visitor at the Eisenberg Institute for Historical Research, University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and visiting Federal Max Planck Institute for the History of Science, Berlin. She will be delivering her lecture on the topic, Histories of Health and Materiality in the Indian Ocean World. Welcome, you all. add my thanks to all of the thanks that have already been expressed. I am very, very grateful to have this extraordinary opportunity to be here, to speak to you, to a full hall full of people. But formal thanks are due firstly to Dr. Shaji, who has made this invitation, and for the entire University of Kerala to invite me and to welcome me so warmly and so kindly. Uh, I'm also very grateful to the Honorable Vice-Chancellor, Professor uh, Kunumal and uh, Professor Patil, who has been speaking earlier, and also, of course, to Dr. Burton Cletus. Uh, <laughs> it has been a great pleasure to work together, uh, to publish the book together, uh, a collaboration that started uh, in 2018 with a conference. We worked right through the entire pandemic um, and we are very pleased to have the result here. And so I want to use this opportunity to tell you a little bit more about the book. Um, and I think uh, I will try to um, make some points that perhaps connect to um, what the Honourable Vice-Chancellor just told you. Um, let me just make sure I know how to go to move the slides. How do I move? Ah, okay. I can move the slides this way. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so, so the Vice-Chancellor just now uh, told us he is a medical doctor and uh, his subject is not history, but history matters to him um, because he has to take, as a doctor, a history, right? And of course, when a doctor takes a history, he asks questions. Um, and he told us this is both the, uh, the patient's own diagnosis, the patient's own history, but also the family history and the broader context. And then uh, he told us um, that there is the right history and then there is the history that may be a mistaken history which may lead to the wrong diagnosis and the wrong treatment. Right? And then he used that as an analogy to invite all of us here to think about how to write the right history. Right? And I think that's a very useful and important starting point for my lecture here. Um, and uh, he has just left, so I have the courage to say um, that actually as historians, um, those of us who are in the field of history, we should all disagree with uh, the Honorable Vice-Chancellor. And of course, <laughs> of course, I don't mean to say that we should be disrespectful, and of course I don't mean to say that he is wrong, um, but actually what I want to say, there isn't one right way to write history. And Dr. Cletus said exactly the same thing, um, there isn't only one history, there isn't just one history of Kerala, there is a history of Kerala that is connected to other places. Um, and for us as historians, it's easy to say 
there isn't one right history, because of course, for the Honourable Vice-Chancellor, who is a medical doctor, it's a question of life and death to find the right diagnosis and the right treatment. So, there isn't any kind of um, flexibility there. But what there is in the field of medicine is also a difference in approach. Ten years ago, that would be different. Even before the pandemic, the mode of investigation would be different. Fifty years ago, that would be different. And the stories would be different, the diagnosis would be different, the treatment would be different, and the overall judgment over whether this was a good process would be different. And that's where historians come in. That's where we recognize that constant process of change. And that's where I would invite all of you in this room, even though I don't know if every single one of you is a student of history, but each one of you lives your life through a certain time period, have lived your life through the major upheaval of uh, the corona crisis, and m all of you will have experienced that in your own way. Each of you will have gone through that very impactful moment in history in a different way. And each of you here in the room will know that your experience is not exactly the same as the experience of someone next to you. That person could be in your own family, that person could live in the house next to you, but for whatever reason that may have to do with their personal story, their financial circumstances, their emotional experiences, their mental health, their class and gender and caste and personal and educational background, we all know that those things had an impact on how we experienced the crisis and how we got through the crisis. So it is not surprising that each of you would tell that history in a slightly different way. And one of the major developments in history, and our book is a, somewhat an outcome of those changes, one of the major changes in the field of history is that we are now interested in validating each of those experiences, each of those stories are valid, rather than us saying, as, we, as maybe a doctor would, one of those is the right story, all the other stories are less important. Right? In the past, historians would have maybe said that. Currently, in the practice of history, the importance is to validate each of those stories. And when I look at this room and think about the multitude of stories and experiences that you will have gone through in the corona crisis, I as a historian wouldn't want to impose one single perspective. My interest as a historian would be in gathering all of those views and identifying trends, diverse patterns and understanding the underlying factors. And that same impulse, that interest in diversity, that concern with local experience, that connectedness of each individual story to larger patterns, historical patterns, geological patterns, geographic patterns, social patterns, that I think is what historians are now interested in doing, and that in many ways is what also is behind the approach or the method in this book. This is the book that Dr. Cletus just showed you. This is the book that we just completed, uh, maybe some two months ago, um, and um, we uh, are very pleased to be able to present the book. But what I want to do is give you a little bit more of an insight into the elements in this book that I think are crucial. So, these, this will not be visible, I'm sure, especially in the back row, these will be too small. These two slides are only here to show you that there are numerous chapters and numerous different topics. We have 13 chapters in total, um, and without having to read those titles, you can believe me, um, to understand that there is, in fact, amongst those 
13 titles, not quite the diversity of views and opinions that we have here in the room, but certainly a wide range of perspectives and views. Um, and it's those that I want to summarize to some extent. So in my talk to you today, I want to make four separate points. And I hope to be able to explain all of those four. Some will be in more depth, some will be um, a little more uh, of a broad view. But hopefully these four points will be meaningful to you in one way or another. And again, I encourage you to think of that in connection to the things I have just said. That history is not a single voice. That, sing that history is not about right and wrong, about getting the story right, but history is about hearing the diversity of voices and making some sense of those. So the four points are, first of all, and I will explain each of those, if they don't make any sense just yet, that's fine. The first point on my slide is to say that things matter. Things, material objects, substances, commodities, broadly speaking, things are important sources for historians. Again, I will come back and explain what I mean by that, but that's the first point I want to make. Things matter. Secondly, mobilities matter. And with mobility, I mean any kind of movement. The movement of people, the movement of ideas, migration patterns, but also the fluidity of people's lives that are both at the place where they originally came from, the place where they work, the place where they live their social life, the place where they eventually die. Patterns of life are not static. Patterns of life are not about one place only. And that has profound consequences, both for understanding those mobilities, but also for the third point I want to, me to mention. The third point is that the organization of space is significant. So it's related to the first. If we are thinking about mobility, and I would take a guess that all of your lives in this room are somewhat part of a mobility or mobilities plural. But none of you, I would hazard the guess, have only ever been in this one place. Now, of course, it matters whether that one place is this room. Of course, no one has lived their life in this room. Whether that this place is this university, or whether this place is Kerala, or whether this place is India, or the Indian Ocean. It depends how you organize space. But how you organize space in order to have historical discussions depends on your experiences. So mobilities and the organization of space are closely related, and space is a key point. So things, mobilities, and space all matter, and I'll explain in more depth what I mean with that. But the, third, the fourth point is the one that is perhaps the most challenging to explain, but I'll come to it at the end of the talk. The opposite is also true. That's a slightly tongue-in-cheek uh, comment. That's because the final paper in our volume, the final chapter, offers a kind of counter view. Um, and I will present that to you uh, at the end of my talk. So, let's begin. Oh yes, so these are the different chapters I will be drawing on to explain what I've just talked about. So let me begin with my first point to argue that things matter. And when I say things matter, I don't mean that. Oh, this is, I'm sorry, this is probably very small again for you in the back. I don't mean things matter in the sense of a kind of um, Marxist materialist view. Not that I disagree with that, not that I think that isn't relevant, but the argument of a kind of materialist history is to say that we have to look at everything from an economic perspective and that economic well-being, the improvement of the economic condition, 
is the only factor that matters in understanding both uh, social structure and historical patterns of time. Right? These principles of Marxist thought are crucial, of course, although there have been many developments of them since then. But when I am talking about material culture or materiality, and both of these terms are in the title of our book, I don't only mean that way of thinking about the past. What I want to add to that is a material culture approach. And what do I mean with material culture approach? I mean with that a trend that has happened in the field of history um, over the last, I would say, decade or decade and a half. And that material culture approach adds another tool, another way of searching for the past. So it's not so much when we're talking in our title about medicine, material culture and trade, it's not so much about saying that medicine has ideas or has philosophies or has a kind of intellectual dimension. It does, of course, but I would argue that it also has a material side. So there are also elements about the practice of medicine, the history of medicine, which of course we know today too, that is about equipment, that is about tools, that is about implements, that is about medical substances, that is about the drugs that we get subscribed to, that is about the ways in which the, medical, uh, the, me the entire medical industry goes about carrying out experiments and research, the ways in which doctors present themselves. All of these are also about objects. They are also about things. There is a material dimension to them. And the mistake that often gets made is to assume that those are timeless, unchanging, and not meaningful, not impactful, they are just there. Material culture as an approach challenges that perspective and says, no, we can actually learn a great deal from thinking about what those objects mean, how they acquire that meaning, and, perhaps most importantly, who has the power to determine that those are the important things. So ultimately, it is about power as so many things are. Who gets to determine which objects hold which meaning? Who gets to declare a medical substance a valid medical substance? Who gets to determine who has the right to exploit the commercial aspects of a certain medical commodity? Who gets to say that this is a safe drug or an authentic drug? But all of that includes a variety of institutions and organizations that are both national and international, and they have huge implications for how the practice of medicine works. And again, if I can draw out a contemporary um, example that we're all very familiar with, of course, the rollout of the vaccination programs, if that wasn't about authority and authenticity and political power and commercial clout, then uh, you know, we will not have paid any attention. All of those mattered hugely in the way in which we experienced and survived uh, the corona crisis. So in many ways, this is the term that gets used for this is materiality. And what materiality means as a term is that it adds a dimension that says, Let's understand how these substances operate, how they get mobilized, and how they work in social political One story about what is important. But that we use it as an analytical tool to see who is part of the conversation about what matters. How does the meaning of a substance get determined? So materiality, like textuality or orality or visuality is the way of looking at materials as a source of investigation, as a site for exploring meaning. 
So, thinking about it in that context, I want to give you the example of my chapter, um, which is an easy way for me to give you a more concrete example of how this material culture approach might work. Um, and again, I can see that it's not easy for you to read the title, but the topic of my chapter was rhubarb. Now, rhubarb is many things. And rhubarb is not one single substance. So the point of my chapter was to explore the many ways in which rhubarb holds meaning. Now, in that sense, therefore, I get to discuss topics like the, the, the materiality of it, the material substance of it, but also the meaning of it, the complex meaning, the itinerary of that in a particular space. So, let me tell you how I began that chapter. I began by presenting a wide range of options, as it were, for understanding what rhubarb is. If you ask a horticulturalist in Britain what rhubarb is, he would say it's a plant with big leaves, with red stems, that grows very profusely in all gardens and it's used to make desserts. It's, made, it's used to make like jams, it's a sweet, it's a food, it's a food substance. If you ask in China, ask a Chinese historian of medicine or a medical doctor practicing Chinese medicine today, they would not be interested in those leaves or in those stalks. He would only be interested in the root of medicine, of rhubarb. Rhubarb root in its dried form is a very powerful medical substance. And it's so powerful as a medical substance because it has both astringent and purgative factors. Now, I won't go into the detail of the medical context there exactly, but it works very well for the digestive system. And in the 19th century, in the absence of other medical substances, the British population was entirely dependent on rhubarb, or rhubarb root as a way of regulating their digestive systems. But the rhubarb that the British could grow, these plants that grow in people's gardens, is not the same as the plant that you can harvest the roots from and where the roots have me those medicinal qualities. For that, it needs to be grown in very specific altitude with a specific amount of daylight, which is actually something that you can find mostly in Central Asia. Now, Central Asia as a region is, of course, a contested region. Parts of Central Asia are claimed by China. Parts of Central Asia are considered uh, part of the broader Indic world. Some of it falls under the control of the cultural realm associated with Persia. So political factors are part of it, but at the heart of it, growing this plant is about specific environmental conditions. Politics has nothing to do with it, except politics has everything to do with it, of course, because trade can only happen in certain regions. Trade can only happen along established trade patterns. Trade can only happen where there is a political uh, system that allows it. Trade can only happen where there is the freedom to trade. So this Central Asian substance that has interest in China, but also had an interest in India, that fell part of, became part of various medical systems, gets understood in very different ways. So the Islamic medical system claims the substance for its intellectual culture and practice, identifies it as having certain medical um, workings that are beneficial, beneficiary, but claims it by giving its, its name to it, which is part of the kind of uh, Persian root of the language. The Chinese have a different way of explaining it, and they claim it with a different name that is, of course, Sinitic. The British Empire claims it as a traded commodity and controls the ports through which it gets uh, into the, the commercial streams. They name it 
Russian rhubarb, or Turkey rhubarb, or Indian rhubarb, or indeed Chinese rhubarb. They're all a similar kind of plant with a similar function, but traded through entirely different political systems. Who gets to name it? Who gets to decide what the actual plant is? Who gets to say what is the medical working of that root? If we listen to the Honourable Vice-Chancellor, then he would claim there is one answer to this, one right way of using rhubarb. And as a doctor, that makes sense, right? Because he has a responsibility for his patient, he has to diagnose the patient, and he might use, subscribe rhubarb for particular conditions, but he would want to know that it is the right substance in the right conditions consumed by the patient, prescribed in exactly the right way. For a medical doctor, there would be one answer. For me as a historian, what I'm interested in is this variety of ways of identifying what rhubarb is, without saying, I'm going to use a Western classification system for understanding medicine, I'm going to use the Linnaean classification system, and I'm going to determine this is rhubarb, right? Instead, I've tried to tell a story that clarifies all of the different systems within which rhubarb was meaningful, identified all the different ways in which the story of rhubarb gets told, which is imminently obvious by the variety of names that are given to the substance, but also the variety of material forms it takes. Right? So if I show you a picture with all different kinds, and this is not a complete picture, you'll see that it ranges from the British dessert uh, of rhubarb to plants that look very different. Some of them grow in the Himalayas, some of them are tra traded as root. All of these are valid forms of rhubarb, and there isn't one single way of determining rhubarb. So using a kind of material culture approach, and looking at the patterns of trade, I come up, in the end, with something that I would identify as an entangled history. Not one that only fits within the British Empire. Not one that only fits within the Chinese medical system. Not one that is only part of the uh, Islamic medical practice. But a story that is entangled, that has mobility in it that has material aspects to it, and that benefits from being told as a diverse story, rather than one that imposes one single narrative from above. So that's how I want to tell that particular story, and that's the attempt I make in that chapter. So the, that's the first point, and I promise that the other points will not be, I won't expand on them so much. The second point I made in my story is that mobilities matter. And mobilities matter particularly in a context in which we write a different kind of history that I would call global history. Now, global history may also actually be identified as a history of mobilities. And what I mean with that, it ties back to what I just mentioned of not telling a single narrative, not identifying from above what is the correct story, but opening history up to this diversity of perspectives. Right? Again, thinking about the variety of the group of people present here, they all have different ways of telling history. If you tell history from a single vantage point, you can really only tell the story that is either the story of the winner, as we just heard, or you can tell the story of the nation. Now, here I am aware that I'm on territory that may well be contested, and there may well be views here that are different, and I look forward in the next two or three sessions that are planned this afternoon and tomorrow to discuss this more. How important in history is the story of the nation. And that's a story that is both about nationalism and about identity, 
But it's also about the permeability of borders, the restrictions imposed by the nation. If you start by saying history is the story of winners, you acknowledge that that's a story that is told from a very particular vantage point. If you write the history of the nation, you are assuming that those boundaries of that nation hold, that those boundaries are significant. So the consequence of that is that you don't see mobility. So for me, mobility and space are closely connected, and I would say that we need to take mobility very seriously. And if we take mobility seriously, then we actually have to question the significance of the national boundary. We have to situate the importance, the undoubted importance of the nation, the nation of India, say, um, and take it into a broader perspective. But let me focus first on why mobility matters. And again, I want to draw on one of the chapters in the book and the work by Dr. Cletus, um, and I'm, uh, I'm sure that if he was giving this lecture, he would give, be giving this uh, presentation in a far more detailed way. I can only touch on it in a very brief way, but here is how I would uh, point out what he's saying there. The focus um, in his story is about a group of people that migrate, that move out of the safe context of Kerala and move into spaces that are unfamiliar. They move, and that's a history, therefore, of migration, and therefore a story of mobility. They move into spaces for the purpose of labor. Sometimes they are forced to move out of an empire context, but they move away from the safety and security and the familiarity of their own community into spaces in which they are less familiar, less secure, less supported by the structures and frameworks of home. The contrast between home and other spaces becomes immediately obvious. But when an individual moves, when an individual migrates for the purpose of labor, for the purpose of forced migration and resettlement, stories that are so crucial for understanding 20th century history as a whole, never mind just the history of Kerala. Migration is a key part of it, but what Dr. Cletus is able to show in that story is the impact that has on mental health, mental and physical health. The perception of well-being disappears or is put on a fragile placement through that process of migration. And what happens then is that people trust medical advice from home. They turn to those who have filled that role of medical advisor in an earlier community. And this process of writing letters, letters about medical conditions, letters about um, health fragilities and concerns about well-being and responses, medical practices, medical um, advice, prescriptions, detailed guidance on dietary practice, on bringing that new way of thinking about health into these new spaces, is what the source base, the set of letters that were sent, uh, allows Dr. Cletus to analyze this process. And what that shows to me, as someone who works more broadly in the field of history, not as a historian of medicine, um, is the importance of that medical connection, the importance of understanding health in a context of migration. That's a different story from the story in the history of health that is told in one space only. Right? We can tell, and that's an important history, the history of health in Kerala, of course we can. We can also tell a history of health in India. But what Dr. Kleeter shows is that when you bring migration and mobility into the story, something else has to happen. Some larger transmission of ideas, some transmission of medical substances, the movement of one cultural context into one that is strange or alien, and things change in that process. 
And that historical pattern of change is significant. Again, not only because of understanding that very specific historical moment, but for us to understand in today's world how migration, the migration that is such a key part, not just of Kerala, also of Britain, of all kinds of population, the impact that has on health and the ways in which we might think about that, the ways in which that creates fragilities and opens up people to experiences that require a special kind of response. So without understanding mobility and migration and its impact on all kinds of other religious, medical, physical practices, um, we don't see the full story. So, things matter and mobilities matter. Let me come to space and the organization of space. I already mentioned and I drew on the example of the people who are here in this room with us. Let me think about how um, I think about it in connection to how you might think about it. And here, again, I am guessing a little bit at the ways in which you all here present think about the organization of space. So, the organization of space has a lot to do with maps, right? Maps represent the ways in which we look at the world. And if you have ever thought critically about a map, you know that a map is a tool to tell a particular story, right? A map isn't actually a representation of reality, it's a code. It's a code that we have learned to understand, we understand it, we can read it, we can translate it, but it's also imposing a particular view. Sorry, I skipped this slide. This is the slide, again, you will not be able to read it. This is the slide that shows four articles um, in our 13 chapters in the book that deal specifically with Kerala, that feature Kerala as a topic. And for those four people, and although we don't have a lot of maps in our volume, the spatial organization in a very simple map, as I show it to you here, um, represents, a, Kerala represents a space on the map, right? And of course, one can draw that map in different ways, one can add different details about it, one can provide a lot more information than this very naked map provides, but it suggests that Kerala can stand alone. It suggests that it's possible to tell the history of Kerala without thinking about other spaces, without thinking about its connections. And again, I'm drawing on the examples that you just heard from Dr. Cletus, uh, who mentioned a similar point. So we look at a map like this, we see Kerala, and we think that's a, that's a space, and we can fill that in with historical detail. The point I want to make, and I think I succeeded in uh, we succeeded collectively, and I succeeded in bringing this point to the attention of those authors who are writing about Kerala. We can't think about Kerala in isolation. That doesn't mean to say that Kerala doesn't have its own story. Of course it does. Of course it does. But it also has multiple stories that are smaller, that are about smaller parts within Kerala. The north of Kerala is not the same as the south. The urban regions aren't the same as the rural, the coastal region is not the same as the highlands. We can divide it even in smaller spaces. But my point here is that we have to understand, just as Dr. Cletus just said, in a broader context. We have to broaden it out to see why that matters. We cannot understand the uniqueness of Kerala unless we compare it to somewhere else. You can never assume that Kerala is unique and special unless you have made sure by comparative methods that other states don't also do this. Right? And this is a big mistake that Europeans have always made and continue to make. Um, and I'm as guilty of that practice, I'm sure, unwittingly as anyone else. The assumption that Europe is greater or better or more powerful than anywhere else without doing proper comparison. Global history, as a field, has made big strides in challenging that kind of um, parochial way of thinking about the past 
and that assumption of greatness or uniqueness without doing proper comparison and proper testing. So for me, Kerala is the perfect example for doing global history. And what I mean with that is not that I want to write the history of Kerala and somehow bring the globe into it. I also don't mean, don't mean to say that the only way we can write about Kerala is if we connect it to the entire planetary perspective. But what I do mean is that we have to think about the contexts within which Kerala matters. And Kerala matters precisely because it was so connected to other spaces, and precisely because comparison allows us to see where it differs. So if we take the whole of the history of India, then we see Kerala in a different perspective. If we compare Kerala, let's say, to the north, of course we know the differences. The differences become much clearer. It becomes then part of a broader Indian history. But as I already said just now, I don't think it's entirely meaningful to study India just as a history of a single nation, as if those boundaries are impermeable, as if those connections, those patterns of migration, for example, are not significant. Right? And ever since I landed yesterday on Gulf Air, um, uh, arriving from Bahrain, uh, people have been telling me that Kerala is closely connected to the Gulf now, right? It's related to the Gulf because of patterns of migration. People go to work in the Gulf. Now people can have their children educated in the Gulf. The Gulf suddenly has become part of Kerala's story, right? And that, I also learned, that has an impact on other patterns of migration, people who move into Kerala, probably to fill the gaps in the labor market, um, from those who have gone off to the Gulf. I'm telling you nothing new. You all know this much better than I do. But I'm telling you that that changes how we write the history of Kerala. Right? That means that the history of Kerala isn't just part of the nation of India, not just part of a national story, but one that goes across its borders, that connects now to the Gulf, but in the past, through Kerala's extensive trade patterns, right through the Indian Ocean. The intermediate step, step that historians almost always make, in my experience, from a perspective of working in India, is to connect it to the British Empire. Logical, of course. The British Empire had a huge impact on every single aspect of life in India, but also in Kerala, and also here. Uh, it, everything was changed by the British Empire. I totally understand that. And therefore, I also understand that the history uh, of Kerala and the history of India has to be framed to understand the 20th century in that perspective of the British Empire. But as someone who is not uh, who was originally not educated within the British Empire, I'm not British, I'm Dutch, um, and I was not part of the kind of um, way of thinking that gets inculcated at a very early age about what the British Empire's significance is. I came to that, I came to learn it from my own students, how they think about that. I question whether the British Empire is the only framework we should use. And I say that particularly from a perspective, and I think that's why you will know much more about that than I do, from a perspective of looking at Kerala. The connections that Kerala made, the deeper history of Kerala, is not just about British Empire, it's about in the Indian Ocean. And the Indian Ocean world, therefore, was the much more meaningful framework for us in putting this book together. And the Indian Ocean world is what is part of the title. So this development of thinking about the Indian Ocean world as the realm in which we try to understand these histories of health and materiality is a development that has very, very explicitly tried to challenge the dominance of the British Empire, the legacy of the British Empire in historical practice, 
and the emphasis on the urban, the literate, and the, the, the um, nation-based, the capitals of political entities, by bringing the ocean into it as a way of organizing space, we can challenge all of those dominant narratives. We can move away from the emphasis just on the literate, we can move away from the emphasis just on the capital, and so on. So, if we take an Indian Ocean perspective, we see a much more diverse world, we can place Kerala in a much broader context. And I would even go one further step, because my rhubarb didn't just circulate in the Indian Ocean world, it did, but it also connected India to China, sent through Central Asia and through the particular empires that vied for control over Central Asia. So I would extend the Indian Ocean world by bringing more of the land-based empires into the conversation and to think about how global south empires, states connect with each other. So how we organize space matters a great deal. So those were my first three points that I wanted to bring to your attention. So, things matter, material culture adds something to our story. Mobilities matter because the past and the present are both highly mobile worlds. And thirdly, the way in which we organize space, the way in which we frame what we think about, has a big impact for what it is we see. We see the mobilities, we see the movement of people and things once we take a broader spatial perspective. That gets me uh, to the final uh, point, this enig enigmatic statement that says the opposite is also true. Um, and here I want to introduce the final chapter uh, in the book. Uh, again, I'm sorry if the title is difficult for you to read. Um, it's a title uh, posed by an author uh, who has a very particular way with words, I would say. He has a very uh, floral way of using language. Um, his name is Harish Narayandas, and he is a prominent uh, professor of the his in the history of medicine, in socio and, and I think his appointment is actually in sociology, um, and is based at JNU in Delhi. And his article, his chapter in the volume was probably the one chapter that sought to challenge almost everything we argued in the book. Uh, he tried to take very much, um, one could say, devil's advocate role, although I think it was more than being devil's advocate. I think he really did want to pose a kind of challenge to our emphasis on materials and materia medica, and our emphasis on um, the kind of mobilities um, and the spatial ranges that we were proposing. So he came at it from a different methodological perspective. He brought anthropological methods to the table, and his chapter features three or four um, small vignettes. These are conversations between patients and their therapists. And um, what the uh, aim of those stories is, is that we see for, with our own eyes the complexities involved. The complexity that Harish Narayandas puts before us is that there are different medical systems at work. And those of you who are interested in medicine will know that from a kind of theoretical perspective and from um, an intellectual perspective. But those of you who don't study medicine, who are not historians of medicine, know it equally from your own experience. There are different methods and practices available to all of us. The market in medicine is as broad as other commercial commodities. So we have at our hands, we have available to us, of course, Ayurveda, but we also have a kind of biomedicine system. We have various other, we have so on and so forth. These are available to all of them. How do they relate to each other? How do we connect these? So the stories that he shows in his, his chapter show the ta tension between those. They are vignettes of individuals who are presented by a therapist who proposes 
one specific way of treating a disease. A treatment that involves a complex set of medical prescriptions, but also dietary restrictions and various spiritual, um, spiritual practices. And what um, Harish tries to show with these quite elaborate um, uh, diagrams that he has created, that if we prioritize Materia Medica, and if we centrally focus on Materia Medica, what we are really looking at is the way in which biomedicine prioritizes drug treatment as its only way of healing the body. It excludes, he argues, and hence the excluded um, diagrams on the right-hand side of the slide, it excludes all of the other ways in which people are treated through tantras, through medical, um, spiritual guidance, through taboos, through the absence of certain practices, through keeping to dietary restrictions, and so on. Those are part of a much um, less materia medicine, medica focused treatment of the body. The tension between those two is what Harish Narandas is interested in. The exclusion of all of those, uh, let's say, spiritual aspects is precisely what challenges the idea of plurality. And so he wants to challenge us by saying Materia Medica excludes a whole range of practices that are actually key for understanding the complexities of medical treatment. So when we think we are going for um, a diversity and um, a, a plurality, a plural practice, we are actually blind to seeing the entire significance of that intellectual dimension. What I was very pleased about is that we were able to include a chapter that posed such a challenge to the whole chapters, to the rest of the chapter, that we were able to integrate that into our story as a way, again, of showing, as I, where I started, that we don't just have one answer, we don't just have one single story. How we tell the story depends on our vantage points, depends on the answers that the methods we use, depends on the sources. So having that uh, included in our volume, I think, adds significantly to the diversity of voices. So this book really tried to bring to the table a wide range of perspectives um, produced by a, a set of scholars that included very junior PhD students to very senior scholars, including David Arnold, who is a retired scholar of India, um, and everything in between. And I think that offers not just an interesting intervention in the field of the history of medicine, not just an intervention in the history of medicine in India, but one that goes much beyond it and a contribution to the field of history. I know that sounds like I'm being, uh, you know, I'm, I'm being very proud of my own work. I don't mean that. It was a very collaborative effort. And Dr. Kletus and I have worked very hard together and we're very pleased uh, to present it. And I hope with that I have given you some indication, not just of the book itself, but the various methods at work there. And I hope they feel in some way significant to each of you. So I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, there is a, a slight bit of uh, time schedule uh, change uh, in our program. Uh, the interaction section, uh, the interaction session will be uh, by the afternoon, and we request you to kindly cooperate for that. And uh, for proposing vote of thanks, uh, we would love to welcome Dr. P. Jinamon, Assistant Professor, Department of History, University of Kerala, Kairo. Good afternoon, uh, all of you. Today uh, we have uh, very distinguished uh, scholars, such as uh, Annie Gillitson from Warwick University, Professor uh, Dr. Martin Kriptas from Bain, and uh, uh, GM Naitsa, uh, our former 
Rabbi Chancellor Nadia Gumarsa, one head of the department, and the professor of uh, economic, uh, economics department, Dr. Uh, professor Fita, and uh, uh, faculty members of our department, uh, Dr. Espiron Mokan, Dr. Sajna, and uh, the teachers from various uh, departments of our uh, university and the school scholars. Um, uh, due to the lack of uh, sufficient time to uh, express my uh, uh, my opinion regarding the presentation made by uh, Dr. Annie Gerritsen and we have a lot of time to discuss all the matters related with the presentation after this session. Uh, so, uh, I would like to directly uh, go to my duty to cast a word of thanks to this gathering. First of all, I get uh, <coughs> us my sincere thanks on behalf of our department and my own behalf to uh, Professor uh, 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 Dr. Simon Takilsar, who has uh, 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 present, uh, present here as the chairman of this session. And uh, I cast <coughs> uh, uh, a word of thanks to uh, Professor Taiman, uh, Simon Takilsar. And uh, uh, this function is narrated by our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Mohan Kumar, sir. Uh, he has made uh, a very significant comments regarding the, the practice of history and uh, uh, on, on the basis of his uh, insights and, uh, and his uh, uh, understanding regarding how to use uh, and practice history in, uh, uh, in many fields of our life and practice. Okay, anyway, I uh, get across my uh, sincere thanks to uh, our Honorable Vice Chancellor and uh, what I'm pleased to say when uh, his critics uh, do, he uh, take time to attend here and uh, uh, we can uh, make contact with him uh, any time. And uh, I also I, uh, uh, convey my thanks to uh, Button Cleeter sir and uh, uh, the presentation was uh, made by Annie Gerritsen uh, and uh, in the following days we can uh, see, we can interact with uh, uh, Annie Gerritsen and uh, uh, our research scholars and the teachers and the faculty members of various departments and uh, social sciences is uh, was ready to interact with uh, um, um, Dr. Gerritsen and uh, uh, on the basis of uh, her presentation we can uh, make comments and uh, queries uh, related with various aspects of our presentation. Anyway, uh, I uh, uh, say thanks to uh, Annie Gerritsen for, for her presentation. And uh, on behalf of the Department of History, and uh, on behalf uh, my own behalf, I uh, uh, convey my regards and thanks to all the participants gathered here for this presentation. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for your kind attention. The food is arranged in the ground floor, and uh, we will be requesting your presence uh, by 2.15 p.m. Uh, in the Sigiraman Hall here.